Hello, it's Peter Merrick, and I'm so excited because I'm speaking with someone I believe is an elder. I'm proud that he's Canadian. His name is Patrick Moore, Dr. Patrick Moore. He was one of the co-founders of Greenpeace. And I'm not going to steal from his fire because his story is unique and special and something we can all learn from. He also has done what an elder should do which makes a person healthy is he's written his story out for this generation and for future generations. And those books that he's written that I would recommend would be Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout, The Making of a Sustainable Environmentalist. And his new book, a bestseller, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and the Threat of Doom. And what I believe is so important for today and the lesson that I hope that we are able to convey through our conversation is we are in need of elders, people who've actually gone through the fire, spent time, reevaluated themselves through introspection, and now speak their truths. So the next generation can learn from them and speak their truths. Because right now, so many people are being deplatformed, being defriend, and are being publicly humiliated, and they're not prepared for it. And Patrick has done that and come through the other side. And today, I'd like to go and share my conversation with Patrick, with you, so you can gain strength from a true societal elder. Patrick, thank you so much for being on with me today. Thanks for having me on, Peter. It's a pleasure. Well, Patrick, you have a very unique story. You started out in the woods of Vancouver Island, and you became internationally renowned for starting an organization that is not the organization that you started. However, everybody knows it's a household thing. So if you can just share a little about your story. Well, as you mentioned, I grew up in the wilderness of Northern Vancouver Island on a float camp, my dad's logging camp uh, in Winter Harbor. You can find that on the map on the very Northwest tip of Vancouver Island. which happens to be the largest island on the west coast of the Americas from Alaska to Argentina. There's no larger island. It's a beautiful place. I still live here in a town called Comox, looking out the window at a glacier. It's a, a beautiful site anyways. We, we're surrounded by mountains. Uh, this area, of course, was under a mile of ice about 20,000 years ago, and thankfully it melted and created this beautiful landscape that we live in. We have so much wildlife. Uh, this is a, a, a special estuary, uh, one of the most important ones on the west coast of North America, uh, with a huge number of waterfowl and eagles and herons, and you would not believe it, how, what, how much bird life there is here, as well as wildlife, uh, deer and bears and cougars and wolves. Uh, so Vancouver Island is still a kind of natural ecology, almost the whole thing. There's, there's like no, hardly, hardly any people here north of the capital of British Columbia, which is called Victoria on the very southern tip. So I, I grew up in a completely different environment than almost everybody of my generation. Uh, but the one room schoolhouse that I had to go to by boat every day only went to grade eight. And so I had to be shipped off to Vancouver to boarding school when I was 14, where I soon learned city ways and excelled in life science in high school and eventually ended up in a Bachelor of Science Honours program at the University of British Columbia, studying biology, chemistry, biochemistry, genetics, ecology, and forestry and every other thing to do with living beings. Uh, my whole life has been consumed with life science. And of course, ecology is one of the life sciences, which brings a lot of other sciences together. It's kind of a, an overarching uh, study uh, of how all life is interrelated. And 
when I was in university, the word ecology actually had not been printed in the popular press. It was an obscure branch of biology that actually originated in the Ukraine in the steps uh, in, in the study of soils. That's where it came from. And it has spread to be plant ecology, animal ecology, global ecology, and a lot of other kinds of ecology. And uh, that's what I've been obsessed with my whole life. Uh, I was doing a PhD in ecology then after my bachelor's degree when I joined a small group in a church basement in Vancouver named the Don't Make a Wave Committee, which became Greenpeace. And I spent six months prior to doing the planning for a voyage, the first campaign of Greenpeace across the Pacific in an 85 foot halibut boat. to stop five megaton hydrogen bomb testing in Alaska on Amchitka Island. And we won. We got on Walter Cronkite because we got arrested by the Coast Guard in Alaska for daring to challenge this bomb. Uh, tens of thousands of people marched in the street. The border was closed between the United States and Canada right across the whole continent when that blast went off. And two months later, President Nixon canceled the remaining planned hydrogen bomb tests. So then we went on against French atmospheric nuclear testing in the South Pacific. We sailed boats in there two years running and stopped them from testing in the atmosphere. They agreed to stop doing that. That's a long story, too. Can we just step back? Yes. Just, I just want to unpack a few things that you, you that. shared. So going back to those first meetings before you got into that 85 foot boat to go and meet the U.S. Coast Guard to stop nuclear testing. Yes. There were two gentlemen that you mentioned in the past were Quakers and they shared about being witness to a crime. Yes. Bearing witness. And that, and that is something which, since we last spoke, I've constantly thought about it because we're looking around and I truly believe we are witnessing some of the hugest crimes against humanity, against the economy, against children, against people's health, against people's mental health, physical health. And many of us feel that we don't have power. And that suggestion of those two men who were Quakers, that changed the course of the world because nuclear testing stopped because you went to be a witness. Share with me how important that you found in your life it is to be a witness to crimes. Well, you know, it's a much broader concept than that in many ways, in that the only way to really gain knowledge is through observation. And that's what bearing witness is a, a, a part of that. And because the Quakers use bearing witness to crimes against humanity or crimes against nature, uh, it's, 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 it, it, it's, they, they use it as a way to uh, experience the truth. And it, it's a metaphorical in some ways. I mean, you can bear witness remotely with video, for example, you can bear witness to something without actually being there. But the point of bearing witness is a bit like a pilgrimage to where the crime is being committed. Right. And as a result of taking that pilgrimage, whether it's in your head or on, on a road or on the sea, you confront it. You, conf you confront it and, and you absorb it, you take it in and you consider it. And it makes you stronger to do so. A it's lot of confronting. So it's what Carl Jung would um refer to as confronting one's shadow because we're all capable of the best within humanity and potentially the worst of humanity. So to, to witness, and one thing I just wanna unpack from what you just shared, 
there was a, a statement that many people have heard in their life, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I yes. would add to it an experience is worth a trillion of those. There's nothing like having that experience in your bones, because at that point, you're, you're right. When you put light, sunlight onto whatever, Yes, that's, it that's cures a, everything. And I think that was metaphor. just as Brandeis said, the greatest cure is sunlight. Well, well I'll tell you that the, the thing, the one that I remember most vividly and that, that it, it, the idea that bearing witness steals you to, to, con, to continue with your, your campaign with, to, to stop it. And that is the killing of whales, which we saw up close and dirty on a number of occasions, but one occasion that I'll never forget was a large pod of sperm whales. This was off Los Angeles, about 500 miles, and a large pod of sperm whales. And what the whalers do is they target the male. Sperm whales are in harems, like orcas are, with a single male and num many females and many young. And so what they do is they target the male and here was a situation where they had harpooned the, the male and they had brought it in to near the bow of the ship. And then the, all the females come to try to help the male in some way that I'm sure they don't know what on earth they're gonna do, but they, they all come in. And then one after another, they are harpooned in the back. And the, the way a whale is killed is with an exploding tip harpoon which goes into their backbone. In other words, they, they explode their spine is how they disable them. And then they, then they let them bleed to death and uh, drag them up and cut them into pieces. So when you see that with your own eyes, it dedicates you to continue to try to stop it for the rest of your life. So when you see a crime up hand and you are a good person, Yes, it's like just 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 this last few days, I'm watching this criminal who beats up this woman in a subway uh, basement. And I, I never seen anything so cruel in my life as the way this man, she, she lost her eye as a result of the beating that he gave her. And I saw her on TV talking actually this morning and that everybody should bear witness to something like that. And maybe they would get the gumption up to try to stop the crime wave that is occurring now, uh, especially in the United States. In Canada, we're lucky. We, we don't seem to have this happening here. And then, miraculously, someone came to us and said, you guys are the only ones that know how to go out in boats. So you have to save the whales. Okay, a few of the people in Greenpeace, well, quite a number of them thought, what, whales? What's that got to do with saving the earth and stopping nuclear war? So they were sort of peaceniks. And Greenpeace, of course, was a combination of eco-freaks and peaceniks. And that's the green and the peace. And so this was going from the peace, stopping the threat of all-out nuclear war, to the green, saving whales of which 30,000 were still being slaughtered every year. Great, the big whales were being slaughtered by Russian and Japanese factory fleets in the Pacific Ocean. So we went out there and got in front of the harpoons. I drove, I was a Zodiac driver because I'd grown up in the bush with boats. That's, I had a boat when I was six. I had an outboard when I was 10. And, you know, I just, and I built my own plywood boats when I was 13, 14, 15. I built three different boats myself. So I knew about boats. My granddad and his three brothers were all fishermen out on the Pacific Ocean catching salmon. So when we went on the on the Phyllis Cormac, the 85-foot halibut boat to Amchitka, I was one of only two or three people who had had any experience at sea. And uh, it, it went on from there. And uh, so we, we, we stopped the whaling with four years of voyages into the Pacific offshore, 500 to 1,000 miles at times, uh, in between Hawaii and Alaska, down towards LA, out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, we confronted those 
whaling fleets over and over again and got the footage on TV. That's what made Greenpeace famous all around the world was to save the whales. But then we went on after we had succeeded in that, the International Whaling Commission, with our lobbying going on as well. We had both the activist and the political side working in Greenpeace. And so I think Greenpeace can take credit for that on, on its own. We, we did that. Whereas the campaigns against nuclear testing, were there were multiple organizations in the front lines of that, but we were the ones that were really in the front lines going with ships into the actual place where they were testing. Uh, then we took on the baby seal slaughter off Newfoundland where 250,000 baby seals still nursing uh, with their mothers were slaughtered each year in a most inhumane fashion. Uh, we wouldn't do that with other species as, as far as I know, uh, but we were doing it with seals just because they were out in the middle of nowhere on ice flows and it had become a tradition. Uh, it was no longer necessary as a tradition because it was originally to be able to survive in the spring and get some food. By this time, it had become a, a, a camp, a, a program to, to get fur for fashion from these baby seals because they have this beautiful white soft fur which changes when they get older to a, a, a coat that looks like a normal seal. We stopped that too. And uh, we went on with various campaigns to stop trophy hunting in the parks, uh, to stop uh, the capture of live orca whales for circus animals. Uh, we, we, we in here in BC, I led this campaign. Uh, to, we stopped the last attempt to catch, capture a live killer whale or orca as they're now called uh, in British Columbia, which had become a, a, a source for these live whales to go into aquariums all around the world in the United States and Canada. Patrick, I live in San Diego. Yes. And there is SeaWorld and there was a big uproar over Shamu and yes. the whales here. And I guess that was part of the protest. Yes, we, we, you know, we didn't take that on early because we were trying to stop the slaughter of 30,000 big whales, wild whales in the ocean. Uh, but when we had succeeded in that, we turned our attention to the live capture of orcas. They had already taken about a third of the population of BC's orcas into the aquariums where they weren't surviving very well. They were lasting for a year or two and then they would die because they hadn't learned how to keep them. They eventually did learn how to breed them successfully in captivity. Uh, I'm still against the, them putting them into what's the, basically putting a human in a bathtub and telling them they have to stay there for the rest of their lives. It's that it, if they're going to have a captive orca, it should be in a, a bay the size of San Francisco or something, but and, and but I don't even think that they should do that. I don't believe in capturing uh, a, a, a species like that and putting it in captivity. Even the dolphins, uh, these are mammals that are free in the ocean. And I, I just don't get it. I mean, it's not as if they're using them uh, for uh, any kind of humanitarian purpose. And I know there's all, also a big argument about zoos in general. Uh, in fact, those zoos do a lot of good work in reintroducing species to the wild that have been reduced in numbers. So there's, there's a, a recovery aspect to what zoos do. But in the final analysis, I'm not too sure about how long uh, we should have zoos just as an exhibit yes. uh, with, wild, with animals which would otherwise be in the wild in cages and in captivity. And I know they try to make it nice by having open spaces without bars, uh, but it's still captive. Well, and that that goes, I believe, to your experience of being in the wild and seeing animals in the wild. And most of your uh, co-founders of Greenpeace and active in the environmental movement, they grew up in apartments and, concrete jungles and they were so detached so their idea of, of wildlife is going to a zoo 
not yes. seeing it in its own nature in its natural habitat. That's right. It's that's, right there. that's a really that's very powerful because your observation because you know where they come from, like you know where the food comes from, where most people don't know where the food comes from. No, they think the food comes from the store. More well, they don't think beyond that very often. Uh, I, that's one analogy I use: is people who live on the thirtieth floor of a condo downtown, they they are sleeping while the trucks bring the food in to restock the shelves at night, and you know they can't grow enough food on their balcony to survive, especially if it's facing north. Uh, they are they are completely dependent upon those farmers out in the fields and. Many people look down upon farmers as being some sort of lower state of existence, when in fact, they are some of the smartest people in the world. And so are all the people who are providing everything that the people in the city need to exist. And that's what the people in the city, see what we've gone through a transition from where 80% of the people were on the land in, in, in stoop labor, growing food, primarily and cutting trees and all the other and cutting stone it took by far the majority of the population with, without technology we have today to produce all that stuff for the few people who lived in a castle with the king or the lord and they were the elite but they were a very small group of people who lived in a kind of semi-urban situation where there was lots of rooms in the same building Whereas the people out on the fields were, were living in basic poverty and squalor and having to have lots of children uh, in order to have labor on the farm. That has changed, boom, in a couple of hundred years to where 80% of the people now live in cities and only 20% or even less in some cases live in the country. But the people in the cities are being taken advantage of by the activist movement to blame the people in the country for the destruction of the environment. If the city isn't the destruction of the environment, I don't know what is, but they see that as normal. Whereas the people who are cutting the timber for their homes to be built and mining the ore for the steel and making the glass from sand and drilling holes in the earth to get fuel and energy and all the other things that they're doing out there, they are denigrated for doing that because they're destroying the earth apparently. Whereas actually what they're doing is providing civilization with every single thing it needs to build a city. And if you look around yourself in a city and see what it's made out of, where do you think it came from? You know, it just didn't spring up out of the ground. And so the real challenge is to do these things, mining, oil, fishing, logging, all these things, to do them in better ways. And that's a lot of what ecology is about. And sustainability is the exact word for that, that we try to do things in ways that are sustainable over the long run. And that's why I support nuclear energy to reduce fossil fuel consumption. It's not because I don't agree with fossil fuels. They should be conserved for things that can be done. Like nuclear energy can replace fossil fuels for at least 50% of the fossil fuels we're using today. All buildings can be provided with electricity from nuclear plants. Right now, we're burning a lot of coal and gas to provide buildings with energy. As a matter of fact, anything that is stationary, that is, doesn't move, can have a wire to it to produce electricity and heat. And that can come from a nuclear plant. Uh, and, and there's a lot of mobile things that can be electrified. Big shovels in mines don't move very far each day. They can be tethered to an electric cable. The trucks though, that come from down in the pit, they need a thousand horsepower. They're not gonna be running on batteries anytime soon and you can't plug them in because they have to move up. So there's airplanes are another pl classic example of something that re really does need fossil fuels in order to be able to operate. So we want to stretch the fossil fuel out into the future as far as we can. So conserving it is logical. So part of what these people are saying, net zero, 
is actually a good plan, except zero is a stupid idea because airplanes can't run on nuclear power or hydropower or any other kind of electrical uh, system. It, it, they need fuel, a liquid fuel. And, and so do big trucks and big mining equipment and many other things. And, but for example, shipping. We have lots of nuclear boats in this world. They've been for 60 years, nuclear submarines, nuclear aircraft carriers, nuclear icebreakers, the Russian icebreaker fleet is all nuclear, six big ships. That, that's so they don't have to refuel them. When they go up there in the winter, they stay there for six months, keeping the sea lane open between Murmansk and Vladivostok over the top of Russia, which freezes right to the coast in the winter. The, there's, it's kind of a myth that the ice is disappearing in the Arctic. Um, like last winter, for example, there wasn't one square inch of the Arctic that wasn't covered in ice. And indeed, even further out, the whole of Hudson's Bay is still covered in ice in the winter. The whole of the Bering Sea, almost right down to the Aleutian Islands, is covered in ice. And over on the other side, Greenland and Norway and the whole north coast of Russia are covered in ice. And this is outside the Arctic Circle. So everything inside the Arctic Circle is a sheet of ice every winter still. And in the summer, it shrinks somewhat with still a great big sheet of ice around the Arctic Circle area. But it's a good thing it shrinks because then the sun can hit the ocean and grow plankton in the summer, which feeds the Arctic Sea food chain, which ends up being fish that seals eat that polar bears eat. So polar bears depend upon the Arctic being open to some extent in the summer. We've got a lot of bad things happening here in, in, in terms of many of the examples you gave about adopting policies that are harmful uh, to people. And, uh, and for some reason during the COVID epidemic, they forgot that there is this absolute tenet in medicine called informed consent. Yes. It's, it's, nobody ever mentioned that term that I can remember. And informed consent means that you do not have to allow any, any medical treatment to yourself, including taking pills, being cut, being sewn up or whatever. You don't have to do that unless you consent to it. To Nuremberg your body, Code. Your, your body is your own. And, I agree. And, and, and they didn't follow that rule. As a matter of fact, they punished people for not uh, consenting. And that's not how it's supposed to work. Informed consent means you tell the person exactly what you are proposing to do to them and why, you're do why they're doing it and all that. That's the informed part. The consent part is when you say yes instead of no. If you say no, they're not supposed to be able to do it. That's been in medicine forever. It's sort of like the other maxim in medicine, which is do no harm. And I believe a fair amount of harm has been done by, you know, the, a fair amount, a lot of good may have been done too, but you're supposed to minimize the amount of harm you do. And the harm that's been done to children by taking them all out of school and making them wear masks and all those things when those were completely unnecessary, uh, that is causing harm unnecessarily. And that's uh, against the principle of informed consent. I, I, I you know, I remember you're, that. You're very generous because I look at the 1947 Nuremberg Code. Yes. Where they tried the medical profession, Nazis, because many people don't know history, but Hitler was able to do much of what he was able to do at the beginning because of the Gesundheit Pass, which was a pass that said that you didn't have typhus. And they were able to target groups and they first target Jewish groups saying that they had typhus and they were able to separate them and then they were able to exterminate them when they were separated. And democide has probably been the biggest killer in the last 200 years where government kills people because we become mechanized. And one of the 
lessons I'm taking from our discussion is you saw mechanization. These people were so detached who were killing these whales and harming the environment. And they were so detached from their humanity. And, and as I'm speaking with you, I'll go back to the witnessing to reattach to our humanity, to the fact that we are connected to everything. And the gift that your parents gave you, I believe, is you were born into nature. I, I love the fact that you shared with me until you were like six or seven years old, you lived on logs and there were 40 other log cabins and people living on logs because there were so many trees on the shoreline, you couldn't set up camp. And the fact that you were really dependent on nature and that's a lost gift and i say it's a gift from from god that we are part of nature we're not separate from nature and we're not separate from our neighbor we are responsible for our neighbor we're responsible for stewardship so like i would like to move and ask a question about greenpeace you are a co-founder you're a scientist you're someone who lived in the environment. And much of what I saw Greenpeace as, it was of stewardship, not looking at human beings as being viruses. We were stewards of the earth. We coexist with the earth. We are from the earth and we manage the earth. But now I see the environmental industry because it's an industry now, sees us as the enemy. Because when I see Bill Gates get up in front of the, a TED Talk and he talks about eliminating carbon, well, right now we're at 415 parts per is a million? Yes, 420 something. And how much when I breathe out and you breathe out, how much comes out of us? 40,000. So or we, we like I just want to point out to humanity, according to the Paris Accords, we are the problem, not just what we're consuming. It's just the fact that we're here. And that is something I want people to really see that because what I'm taking from our conversation, you're out in the environment, you're a scientist, you know this stuff, but other people, most of what they see and they hear comes from this little box. I realized like, I, I saw what you were doing in the seventies when I was a little kid, cause I'm 53. So I sort of have recollection of that, but I saw it from, my television and there was an authority telling me what I was supposed to think and there was no reason for me to even question it. So I'd like to talk about the carbon situation, but I think your first Eureka moment that like we're going off the rails in Greenpeace was, was it chlorine? Yes, I'll, I'll just talk about that briefly because you mentioned the whole idea of, of, of humans being part of nature rather than being some kind of virus. Uh, th there were two reasons why I had to leave the movement or Greenpeace in particular, of which I had been a director for 15 years and was the leader of it for a few years in the, in the middle of those 15 years. Uh, first, at a philosophical level, they were beginning to call humans the enemies of nature, the enemies of the earth. And so this is the demonization of the human species as something separate from nature, uh, some, and, and in other words, an evil element in, in life. So that's highly philosophical situation where they're making value judgments about good and evil. But the sharp end of the stick, which is what really made me say goodbye, you guys, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm out, was there my fellow directors, none of whom had any formal science education, uh, they were environmental activists, social activists, P 
people, entrepreneurs looking for a career because now you could make a living in the environmental movement. We had about a thousand people on the payroll by this time uh, and fundraising had become a major factor in our decision-making process. And, uh, but, you know, I try to hold their feet to the fire to only take on campaigns that have scientific merit and are grounded in truth. And all of a sudden, somebody's suggesting we should have a campaign to ban chlorine worldwide. And uh, it is true that uh, many uh, compounds like DDT, uh, PCBs, uh, dioxins are chlorinated hydrocarbons. That's a class of elements of chemicals. Um, but I said, okay, but you have to be a bit more nuanced here because chlorine is one of the most important elements for living beings. And so we can't just ban chlorine worldwide. We have to have, you know, we could be banning some chlorine compound for certain uses or whatever in the same way that we banned DDT for agricultural spraying of over the crops. But they shouldn't have banned DDT for malaria control uh, because it's the most effective way to control malaria and it's used indoors uh, it's not used outdoors, uh, but it was banned for malaria control. And as a result, countries like Mozambique, who had no choice because the, the superpowers said you either ban malaria uh, treatment by, with DDT or we take away all your money. Uh, and uh, so that it was blackmail that was used to impose this on many African countries where malaria just skyrocketed after they took away the DDT. But more importantly, Chlorine is one of the most important elements in the whole periodic table for human health. Adding chlorine to drinking water was the biggest advance in the history of public health and also to spas and swimming pools, preventing waterborne communicable diseases like cholera from spreading with people who are enjoying their swim or their bath. And Secondly, about 80% of all our drugs, chemical, pharmaceuticals are made with chlorine chemistry and about 25% of them actually have chlorine in them. Uh, when I was a kid, iodine was the most important thing in the medicine chest you know, in a remote community with no doctors. Because if you got a cut, you put iodine on it to prevent infection. Iodine is in the same family as chlorine. It goes fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, adenosine. Those are the halogens. They are very strong oxidizers. In other words, they're powerful antibiotics. And so they have a hugely important use in that sense. And then take salt, table salt, sodium chloride. It is an essential nutrient for life. You have to, we have to have it. That's why Gandhi made salt at the sea uh, to protest against the high taxes that the British were imposing on the people of India. And uh, it was an, a, a, a symbolic gesture, but it was very, very effective. Uh, sodium chloride is necessary. But so if they you wanted, to, Patrick, so they wanted to, like, you people at Greenpeace at this at this moment, this juncture, they wanted to just completely get rid of the most important um, chemical compound that has been used, you know, to save billions of people through their drinking water and yep. cure people. And they just wanted to get rid of it. And they were so the disconnected. Of, yep. What were the arguments like at that point? The name of the campaign was Ban Chlorine Worldwide. And they, after I left, they continued on with that campaign. They brought it into reality and used it publicly um, because chlorine is the devil's element. That was their terminology. And polyvinyl chloride, which is vinyl or PVC, which is an, an inert plastic made from natural gas and chlorine combined to make polyvinyl chloride. It's what houses are clad with the plastic siding on houses is pvc your credit cards are pvc uh pvc is everywhere and they they call it the poison plastic e even though it is 
not even slightly poisonous. So it, it was just a completely irrational, stupid campaign that they thought made a good slogan for raising money. And that was where I realized that Greenpeace had gone from being a volunteer group with noble intentions to save the world from all out nuclear war, to stop the slaughter of the whales, into a business with advertising slogans and eventually a racket selling junk science. That's where it ended up now. That's where it is now even knows who the leader of Greenpeace is or who the directors are. They're all behind closed doors. We used to be right out in the open. We were all spokespeople in the media saying who we were and what position we had. We were wide open. They are now hiding behind the World Economic Forum, basically. And are part of that cabal, which is promoting- Can you focus on that? Because it's very interesting, because that's a really good thread. You you saw this organization, Greenpeace, have no noble intentions get transformed. And one of the things that I find very interesting is the is it called the Club of Rome came up in that was during the time of Greenpeace's inception. The, the, right, the, and then and then there was uh, yeah. Ehrlichman. What was a population bomb? Right? Yes, that actually. All you know, I remember when I was a kid, and again, I have years behind me now, and I was watching Archie Bunker, and I was watching his, uh, his son-in-law, Mike Sevick, mm -hmm. who is... That was a funny show. Yeah, it was a great show, and I'm, why can't I remember his name? Like, uh, um, his father was famous. You know, Meathead? Meathead. Yeah. Uh, and he was actually talking about we're not going to have children because there's too many children and they and everybody was like humans are now the problem and you know they would talk about somehow in Africa they would just have these people stop having children stop being human yeah I never subscribed to that it was zero population growth was the official name of the organization that promoted that and uh so basically we have the same thing happening now with net zero. It's basically an attempt to stop humans from flourishing. Yes. And, and because humans are bad and ne a negative factor in the universe, apparently. And this is all through history. Like it was only 200 years ago that they were still burning witches in Salem, right? And they were throwing virgins into volcanoes in Mexico before that. And I don't know why it's always women that take the short end of the stick on this anti-human side of things. Because you and I use the example of a sperm well with a harem. Yes. You and I are expendable. They don't need that many of us. But for humanity to continue, we need both children and women. And again, it's very, it's, it's anti-human. And I'll give you an example. First, they attack being a male because you and I have come out of our ancestors to protect the tribe, to sacrifice for the tribe. So you want to completely demoralize men and then you attack the women. And you hear all this transhumanist stuff coming from the World Economic Forum, the Club of Rome, from the IMF, like how they'll lend money and create money, the World Bank. All these organizations have creeped in to take over the narrative. Many people, I've gone back to being biblical, the love of money, not, not, not like money, the use of money, it's the love of money. It's like people are bought off. I'll give you an example that sticks in my mind. I was reading that Durham region, which for our American friends, that is a county outside of Toronto. They raised salaries during this, whatever you want to call it, anywhere from 58% to 300% in the public health. And none of these people 
you can relate to this, Patrick, are doctors. Yes. So these people, through the love of money and also fear, have implemented policies that are anti-human, anti-children, anti-social capital. Because now people are scared of their neighbors. They're now, it's a breakdown. And I don't believe they didn't know what was going to happen because I was reading that many of these countries implemented propaganda on their own countries. It came out in Canada that the army was allowed to use propaganda tools. Obama allowed propaganda to be used in a, in a presidential order on the American people. There's these messagings going by and I, this is what I want to focus on, Patrick. Well, it just came is... out uh, two days ago, I think, uh, a member of the United Nations, a high level ranking official of the UN speaking to the World Economic Forum had the nerve to boast that- Scientism. The United Nations, no, the United Nations asked Google, I don't know, they ordered Google or they said to Google, would you please just put our intergovernmental panel on climate change information at the top of all Google searches about climate change? And they did do that. And everybody, know, everybody knows that it's rigged like that, but she actually had the nerve to boast about it. That she said, we own the science, the IPCC, Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the UN. We own the science and we, we don't want all this false information, which by which she means other opinions showing up on the Google search. We want only our stuff to show up on the Google search. And somebody said to me, well, I put that on my Twitter and someone said, well, we guess we should go to a different search engine. I've tried other search engines and I think the United Nations has had a chat with them too, from what I can tell, because uh, they, the, the ranking of the information you get on climate change on pretty well all of them goes in favor of demonizing carbon dioxide and calling on a climate em emergency to come forward. One thing I do want to point out, and it, it, it's become generic in, in society to call carbon dioxide carbon. That is not very scientific. It's like calling water hydrogen, H2O, right? CO2 is not carbon. It is carbon dioxide. It is a gas. Carbon is a solid. It is either black as soot or nice and shiny and clear like diamond or gray like graphite, which is harder than, than soot. It has many different forms because one of the reasons carbon is the basis of life is it is the most versatile of all elements in terms of combining with other elements. It is absolutely in that way miraculous. There's no other element that is capable of doing what it does. And so that's why the chemistry of carbon is called organic chemistry. The chemistry of every other element is called inorganic chemistry. That is the scientific definition of the word organic, not what you buy in the store which is just a marketing term. All food is organic. And so to say that a certain lettuce is more organic than another one is ridiculous. It's just right. they've, they've used We're different- part of nature. Like you, you can't remove us from nature. And I fully agree with you, Patrick, because it, it's an anti-human agenda because I made it out of- Clearly my, it is. My children, if you have children, you have grandchildren, According to the powers that be who are saying that carbon dioxide is evil, I want you to understand that that means you're evil. And I believe in humanity's ability to overcome any issue if we're not being constrained and censored. Patrick, one thing that I... I'm going to turn to you because I remember reading this about how wonderful 
the environment is, nature is. Several hundred million years ago, there was just too much oxygen in the atmosphere. And then magically animals started showing up who took in the oxygen and turned out carbon. And it just happened. It happened in a short period of time. I don't know what that period's called, but it was almost like magic. And you tell the story that we were going through a carbon dioxide drought. And magically, similar to when nature, God created living life, humans and other animals that breathe in oxygen that converted into carbon dioxide, magically, out of nowhere, the industrialization of humanity and making life better happen and reintroduce carbon that was stuck in the ocean and stuck in the permafrost and actually save this earth. And can you elaborate on how carbon dioxide and industrialization and human beings creating it? Because I, I really think the problem that many people think, they think what the, the, a human being can solve everything, that we can duplicate what's already been here. And there's a genius in nature that we just showed up in doing it when nature needed it, similar to the first time life showed up, like, uh, like animals and mammals and insects, when it needed it then to turn oxygen into carbon. And now we're now turning, you know, we're releasing the carbon that's disappeared. Yeah, it is quite fascinating. Uh the the the, the uh, history of the long-term history of life of course uh, at the beginning there was no oxygen in the atmosphere there was car a, lot, a lot of carbon dioxide from volcanic activity during the early years of the earth when it was still really hot and so all of the uh, all of the co2 in the atmosphere and the oceans came from the inside of the earth as did all the water came but water condensed mostly as a liquid uh, and made the oceans, whereas carbon dioxide is a gas, no matter what state the earth is in. You can't get cold enough to make it into ice anywhere on the earth, yet we have to do that artificially if we want to make dry ice, which is frozen carbon dioxide. Uh, and it carbon dioxide does not go through a liquid stage on its way to a solid stage. It goes directly from a gas to a solid. So carbon dioxide is all always in the form of a gas, either in the atmosphere or dissolved in the ocean. The ocean has nearly 50 times as much carbon dioxide in it as the atmosphere does. So a very small change in the ocean CO2 by warming and cooling, when the ocean warms, it gives off gas, including CO2. So if the ocean gives off 1% of its CO2, it causes a nearly 50% increase in atmospheric CO2. So these there's, there's huge fluxes involved in this, but CO2 was always in the atmosphere and is the only reason that life could have existed because life is carbon-based and all the carbon in life comes from CO2. That's its origin. From CO2 in the water originally, when life was confined to the sea, for three billion years, life was confined to the sea, unicellular and microscopic. Not a very exciting time. But during that time, a lot of things happened. They went from bacteria to cells with chloroplasts and mitochondria inside them. So that was from the prokaryotes to the eukaryotes, that's called. Also photosynthesis came into being which was the miracle of plants having chlorophyll, which made them able to combine carbon dioxide and water, two very simple compounds, and make sugar, glucose primarily, which became the energy for all life forever, including now. So that happened really early on, like three billion years ago. Another one of the things that happened was early life had no sex. 
the cell, the, the, the individual cell, just split into two cells, the same. So that's how life, when life started, everything. So the only way that any change happened was through mutation. Whereas when male and female came into being from mitosis, which is this just a splitting and two equal identical cells occur to meiosis, where the, 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 the nucleus separates into two separate DNA pockets and, and, and they are then different from each other. Now you have sexual reproduction, which really sped up the evolutionary process incredibly. Now this is before any multicellular organism existed, before anything came on the land. Multicellular organisms came into being 540 million years ago is the date they use for the, the Cambrian period. And the Cambrian explosion refers to the fact that because of tissue differentiation, in other words, we are made of many different kinds of tissues. If it wasn't for that, you can't just have a, one kind of tissue making a multicellular organism. It would just be a blob of cells all the same. But we are not a blob of cells all the same. We're a blob of cells of many different varieties. And when that happened, so tissue differenti differentiation was made it possible for multicellular life forms. And I mean really many millions of cells in individual organisms. And the first ones were all in the sea and they were kind of like jellyfish. They had no skeleton like vertebrates do and they had no shells like shellfish and corals and all the species in the sea that make calcium carbonate as a armor plating for themselves. Mussels, barnacles, clams, oysters, shrimp, crabs, coral reefs, you name it. There's a lot of them because many marine species figured out how to do this in order to protect their soft bodies from predation. Some didn't. Jellyfish, for example, they seemed, well, they, they, most of them developed stingers of some kind so that things left them alone, or they weren't really worth eating, like those clear jellyfish that you see that are about the size of a cup. They're, they're not really worth eating. And there's some reason why things don't eat them anyways, because otherwise they'd be all gone because they're really easy. They'd be really easy to eat them all. Uh, but so different defenses came with different species, but this, the defense of a hard shell around your soft body was a pretty brilliant one. Yes. The only problem was the creation of those shells was by combining calcium in the sea, which came from rocks on the land through erosion, and carbon dioxide in the sea, which came from the atmosphere through absorption. And that made the calcium carbonate shell which then when the animal died, sank to the bottom and became part of the sediment and turned into limestone. So all the limestone, the white cliffs of Dover are made of calcium carbonate from coccolithophores, which are a microscopic phytoplankton. And there, there, there is a hundred million billion tons of carbon from the CO2 that has been turned into shells that is now rocks. So in other words, it's not in the ocean anymore it's in, it's tied up in rocks, sequestered. Yeah. Sequestered is the name they use now for when they're, these ideas that will take carbon dioxide out of the air with a factory and yeah. bury it in the ground. That, they call that sequestration. Well, the biggest sequestration by far in the world is the hundred million billion tons of carbon that are in carbonaceous rocks, which were created mostly by life. And that the fact of that is what has caused CO2 to gradually go down from 5,000 parts per million. We know that around the Cambrian explosion 500 million years ago, that's where it was, five to 6,000 parts per million. Over the millennia, it has gradually in fits and starts, it went down to 180 parts per million during the most recent glacial advance 20,000 years ago when the seas cooled and absorbed more CO2 from the atmosphere. And plants die when? 150. 
150. So we were almost at that that level where plant life would die. On it's believed it's, well. It's believed that at high altitude the plants did die because as you go up the air thins. Yes. So even if there's 180 parts per million, if it's in a much larger volume, right. The plant would not be able to get enough CO2. It's sort of like with, with animals, there's, there's nearly 20% of the atmosphere is oxygen now because the plants put it there. Yeah. The, the trees put it there and, and all the other plants. And that, if you take that down to 10%, we're gone. We, we don't, we need a certain amount of oxygen to survive. And the amazing thing is, is that we need like 15% or more oxygen and plants survive at 0.04%, at 0.015% is where they die. And that, that is, they are, they are capable of surviving in such a much lower concentration of their most essential nutrient than we are like oxygen one, one thing that i find fascinating is and this is this part that aggravates me because i just feel like there's idiots who just start with a conclusion and they end with a conclusion that came from some talking head or some edu uneducated person in a topic where they say carbon is bad yes carbon dioxide is bad and if you have more carbon in the air, and it's a known fact with growers that if you have a greenhouse and you pump it with anywhere from 800 to 1200 parts, and you shared with me, it's because it's economical. It'd be better if it was at 2000. Trees use less water and they grow faster because it is food for them, food. And the, the fact is I breathe out carbon because the whatever you want to call it god nature i was created you were created to work with the environment to provide the nutrients because it didn't have it didn't have species that were producing carbon but we showed up and we started taking out the oxygen because at one point in the atmosphere the oxygen was so high it was going to be lethal to the plants. And then we came about, we just, boom, not just us, but other species like us who needed oxygen. And it's, it's almost miraculous. The same, as I mentioned before, with industrialization, it just happened when we needed it. And so there's, there's an individual that I'd like to, to, ask you about because he had a huge impact on my psyche back in the I believe the 1990s when I first became aware of like my environment was Jim Lovelock because both of you had a huge impact on each other and just for people listening Jim Lovelock came up with Gaia Theory. He was hired by NASA to figure out whether or not there was life on Mars and to actually come to that understanding, he turned back to the Earth and he saw that there was biofeedback. Biofeedback, where I would produce waste, but only human beings talk about waste because nothing is really waste because some other species or some other organism will use my waste. And he was very uh, apocalyptic. I remember him in an interview saying that the earth has the ability to heal itself. The question is, will humanity be there afterwards? And you shared with me a story about how you helped change his view on the future of humanity and our place in the cosmos. And he changed your views on nuclear energy. If you could share that with me, Patrick. Yeah. It's a wonderful memory. Uh, I had read all his books, J Jim Lovelock's books, and uh, I, 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 I agreed very much with his holistic view of the cycles of life. Um, he, he had a brilliant mind 
uh, he, he proved that there was no life on Mars, but that didn't stop NASA from continuing to speculate that there was life on Mars because that's the best way to get money out of the government to study Mars some more. And, uh, but that's a side, side trip. Uh, he understood life on Earth very well, but he also shared the pessimism of the doomsday crowd who said that humans are destroying the planet. He, he, he once was quoted as saying that the human species will be reduced to a few uh, impoverished people huddled around the Arctic Circle. And that's all that will be left of us. With feudal lords. Yeah, oh yes, ruled by some kind of lords, yeah, or, or overlords. Uh, yeah, it was a really totally dark vision of the future. And so, but as a result of my believing that he had some of the most wise things to say of anybody, I emailed him and invited myself to come and talk to him because I knew that he supported nuclear energy. And I had gone through the early years of Greenpeace making, I already knew I'd made a mistake in lumping nuclear energy in with nuclear weapons. Because the way I put it is we should have lumped nuclear uh, energy in with nuclear medicine because nuclear medicine is used very effectively for radiation treatment for cancer. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of use of radiation in medicine and it's a positive thing. And so is nuclear energy. And we made that mistake because of our fear of all out nuclear war and fear of radiation and all, all those fear things that can make your worldview twisted out of all proportion. Yes. And so I wanted to find out from Jay Lovelock in person I wanted to talk to him about why he thought nuclear energy was okay. And, uh, and I also wanted to share with him my very more positive vision about carbon dioxide and its role in the history of life. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's the, need, the need actually to reverse the downward trend in CO2 because it had become lower than it had been in the whole history of the earth during the last glaciation, most recent glaciation. I never say last glaciation because that could mean the final one. And we have no reason to believe that the Pleistocene Ice Age has ended. We appear to actually be already in the 80,000 year decline in temperature into the next glacial maximum, which would be 80,000 years from now. So not too much to worry about tomorrow. But uh, I went over there and he, inv he graciously invited me to his home. I arrived in the afternoon we had a nice dinner with his wife and son and uh, slept overnight in his house. And the next morning we got up and went out to walk on uh, a, a cliff above a beautiful, uh, well, it's, it's, it's that part north of uh, Cornwall where you end up going into the channel that goes to, it's not York, I don't think, but anyway, it's a beautiful part of the country. It's just total countryside. And we walked for four hours talking about these things, came back for lunch. And uh, later in the day, I got on a train and went away realizing, he told me, he said he'd be perfectly happy to have a nuclear reactor in his swimming pool out behind his house to provide the heat to his home, just a little one. And uh, what harm could it cause? Uh, he, he explained to me his interpretation of the history of nuclear energy, how uh, there'd been a couple of blips, but till then, uh, was this before Chernobyl? No, it was after Chernobyl, of course. Chernobyl was in 1986. Yes, and it was an anomaly. Uh, it, it was a, a total exception. Not only were those reactor designs flawed, the, Chern the whole Chernobyl fleet of reactors that the Russians built behind the Iron Curtain without any input from the West in terms of safety, they took their plutonium production reactors, which were meant for making plutonium for weapons, and basically transformed them into uh, electricity production. But 
they were a flawed design. But they worked fine as long as you didn't invite a group of engineers from Moscow, which were sent down to look at one of the four reactors and do an experiment. The, the Chernobyl accident happened during an experiment, not during normal operating uh, conditions. And they, the, the, the people who came down there, the nuclear physicist people, told the operators of the reactor to turn off the safety systems that would prevent a runaway reaction from occurring. So the operators turned off the safety systems and it happened. The reactor blew up. And that was basically a, an, an atomic explosion. It wasn't a meltdown of the core like Three Mile Island and Fukushima. Fukushima is a whole other question, but nobody died from radiation at Fukushima. Nobody died at Fukushima until they evacuated the whole town, which wasn't really necessary from a radiology, radiology point of view. It was a public relations thing to, to move those people. But they also evacuated seven intensive care wards in hospitals, resulting in the death of 2,000 people. So they killed so, 2,000 people by evacuating the town. And what's, what's that saying, Patrick? Uh, something, uh, good intentions create... Yeah, as paved with the way to hell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that, and that, really, that, that really is something that I think I'm following the theme of, of your life. And this is something, as I shared at the beginning, that uh, what's important is you're an elder and you've seen you've witnessed, you've witnessed nature, you wit we, you witness potential, you know, horrors of how we treat fellow species, like the potential of blowing us all up and you, you dealt with that. And you also witnessed how money corrupts because Greenpeace got co-opted by the World Economic Forum by the club of rome yeah. by interest like i remember when i was young there was a company called benetton and they were like you know it became you know like they were being co-opted right like i'm green i'm this yes. I'm that. Well, I, and I'm, I'm certainly not saying that the majority of people who've bought into this world is ending due to carbon dioxide climate emergency uh, uh, that many of them have good intentions. They, of course. They are not aware of the fact that it is basically a hoax. And I'll just explain for people the, the structure of this situation. Yes. The quiet part is the politicians giving the scientists in the universities money to produce the scare story for them. Yes. And that, that, that is billions of dollars flowing into the university systems, all of whom have become cash cows for the scientists who, if they don't mention climate change in a, in a negative way in their proposal, they're not going to get any grants, right? It's all fixed at that level because the politicians want this story so they can tell their constituents, you better do this, we better do this, or the earth will come to an end, basically, for, for, through a climate emergency. And... So that's where it starts, but that, that is not publicized. The scientists then inform they, the media, the politicians, and the activists. So they're told what their conclusions have to be, and if you don't provide yeah. the conclusions, you don't get funding. I just want Precisely. to share with something that I... Well, it's just, it just goes without saying. It, it, there's Many people have come out and blown the whistle on this that have made it clear that if... If you don't have climate change in your proposal and you don't have it twisted in some negative way, uh, you're never going to get any money because that's not what they want. The politicians are paying for this. 80% of all the research in the universities is from taxpayer money. In other words, coming from the bureaucracy at the behest of the politicians who want this information to be slanted in this way. So the, the doomsday scenario is embedded right from the beginning that CO2 is going to cause a climate catastrophe and, and in fact already is causing a climate catastrophe because every hurricane is now blamed on climate change. Even though there is no trend in hurricanes going back as far as 
we can go back in, in, in knowing how many and how strong and et cetera they were. There's way more infrastructure in the way of hurricanes now. And if you look at the recent uh, Florida hurricane, Ian, the people are building thousands of homes on the barrier islands, like offshore, right, in a hurricane place. And they're building them out of ticky tacky half the time. You look at these root dis destroyed buildings, they don't look very substantial to me. I agree. You know, you have in a hurricane place, especially right near the ocean, especially if it's sand, never build your house on shifting sand. That was in the Bible, right? And these people are building their houses on shifting sand and they're building inadequate structures. I got a question to ask because this is a pet peeve with me and it has to do, well, it's, it, when, I, when I was reading one of your books, I remember reading a section saying viruses, carbon dioxide, two things you can't see, but we're scared about. You know, the fact that, and, I, and I've seen Project Veritas where they were talking to people from CNN saying, it happens to be this scary thing that I can't talk about because I won't be able to post. And you mentioned, well, it's also like carbon. You know, it's like, this is the next carbon dioxide. This is the next lockdown. So we're going to lock them down and how we've been fed things. Like when the planes stopped flying after 9-11, like they checked the skies and they saw how clean it was. And now they're going to lock us down. And you see a gentleman who looks like a Bond villain saying things that are just like i i don't know why anyone would take this guy serious so humanity will get grumpy with the great reset you know like all that stuff and then you've got little puppets like our prime minister who yeah he, i i believe he spent some time in nature patrick because he never had a job so he was in your parts snowboarding for most of his life before he decided to disingenuously use his father's name to get elected. Because if his name was Joe Blow or Peter Merrick, he wouldn't be prime minister. Right yeah, now. but you, you know, you can't blame him for taking advantage of that. Uh, it's, right. just, it's just too bad that he is a puppet. Uh, the people behind, it's people behind him who are putting these ideas in his head. Oh, for sure. And I'm, I, one thing I point out and you probably, and, I, and I've noticed this, like Agenda 21 was taking over the municipalities and implementing these anti-human dictates that the rest of us were supposed to fall, follow. And I remember waking up one day, I was in CTV, I was in the studio, and Mayor Miller, former mayor of, of Toronto, which is Canada's largest city, it's the third largest city in North America after New York. LA, and then it's Toronto, followed by Chicago. So he was there and he was representing the World Wildlife Federation. Now, if you start digging into the World Life, the World Life Wild Federation, on whatever, you find out it was created by Prince Philip. Prince Philip is one of the founders of who? The Club of Rome. And then you look at the puppet prime minister, who is his top advisor? It happens to be Gerald Butts. Gerald Butts is worth several million dollars. How did he become wealthy being a public servant, right? He, he advised Delton McGinty. He parasitically found Justin Trudeau and became his best friend. And now he's his top advisor. And he ended up working for the World Wildlife Federation and when he joined Justin, when he got into to power, he got this like six, seven hundred thousand dollar payoff as like severance or something like that to work for the government. It was just, it was just, it's crazy. And I'm sure you've run across these people that they use polar bears and things that you've said before. I don't witness with my own eyes. All I see is yeah. the screen. And the screen tells me, and I don't even know if it's a green screen. 
it, it is it is rather corrupt at the core at this point. Fair to say that 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 Western civilization is in a bit of a downward spiral at this time. It's almost like a death wish or some kind of suicide pact that has been adopted with this net zero thing. And it's amazing that people have to say we should stop with the net zero thing. Like it should be obvious to everybody that that was stupid. You know, if you electrify every car, and I'm not against electric cars, I just don't believe on forcing them on everybody. But if, if everybody were to have an electric car who has a gas car now, it would nearly double the amount of electricity we need. At the same time, we're shutting down gas plants and coal plants and nuclear plants and opposing hydro projects. And, and, and so it's, that can't happen unless we double the amount of electricity we produce. And th th then on the other hand, if you, this, this re even further ridiculous idea that batteries will be the backup for the intermittent wind and solar plants, how can you charge the batteries if the wind isn't blowing? So the only time you can charge the batteries is when you are also having to supply the full amount of electricity that is needed at the moment, right? And I agree. When you start, Patrick, when you start digging into like lithium batteries, the average miner of a lithium for lithium lives to about 35. The fact that you will not recoup um, the energy that goes to make an electric car these electric cars are bombs. I'm in California right now. They've outlawed combustion engines by 2035. And when we were having a heat wave, they were telling us not to plug in our electric cars. It's like this is- yeah, But that, 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 isn't, a, that isn't, an, an, isn't an indictment of the electric car being a real thing. Yeah, it, 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 they are a real thing and they they apparently work fine. A few of them have caught on fire, I understand. But yeah. gasoline cars catch on fire, too, but not the kind of fire that lithium makes, which is like all, uh, virtually impossible to put out. I understand. I mean, it's sank it's a, a bomb. Whole it's right. a literal it's a it's a literal bomb. But the air, the reason I brought that up, Patrick, is in Canada, they're implementing a carbon tax. They're getting rid of, they're telling farmers to stop using fertilizer for nitrogen. Like you're sitting here, like I'm sitting here going like, who are these people? And like, they're not even talking to the right people. And what that's, do you think about that? that? That's, okay. Well, that's the downward spiral we're in. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you have to hit rock bottom before you wake up. And collectively that is so i i i don't know how, how to make this I, I mean i feel fine in the sense that i'm okay right i don't I, i'm not in the downward spiral uh al although certainly the value of my assets has gone down due to the re re recession that they have put us in with the inflation reduction act and our own policies here in Canada, mimicking much of that sort of mentality, uh, that it, we're trying to spend our way out of a, a recession. I've heard of that happening before. I don't believe it ever worked. Yes. Uh, so we, we are being led by morons to a, to a large extent uh, who do not understand how the world works at all, uh, who have adopted net zero as their slogan uh, and still think that that's where we're going. And they also have a lot of levers in the financial and political world. Uh, they Science is in probably the worst condition it's been in since before Galileo. Uh, you, you mentioned that woman who is in charge of communications at the UN. And she said, we own science. Yes, she said, she was we talking own science. scientism. And, and so th this is uh, about the most anti-science thing anyone could possibly say, because the whole purpose of science is open inquiry. 
That's the whole well, idea. This, this is an idea of virus that's infected because I saw Fauci on television who's never been in a lab. Carrie Mullis, who came up with the PCR test, had serious issues with Fauci. He just untimely passed away in August 2019. He got a national television and he said, if you question me, you question science. And I'm going, that's right. Demigods? Like, like what is that? This? Is, so that is the mentality. There's, there's yes. Priests. Okay. It's now priests. Like, you put on a white coat. You put, you. Yes. You talk That's with authority. And but, I have to know, just the share real, The real question is still why. Uh, we know that this was done on purpose in a lab in Wuhan. There's, there's, there's really no doubt about that. This was done with Fauci's money. He, he fun funneled it through a nonprofit in the United States to Wuhan to do this experiment, if you want to call it, to do this transformation of a virus into one that was not infectious to humans by using genetic modification in mice. We know the whole sequence. It's all been told, but on the other hand, we haven't had a formal investigation because they haven't allowed one, right? Now, why would they not allow a formal investigation if they were innocent? So that we know that they did it. The only thing we don't know is why would well, any- Can I share with, can I share with you? Will you tell I, me your, your interpretation of why? I spoke with a gentleman, his name is Edward Dow. He was an ex BlackRock manager. And he is writing a book right now, and it's coming out in November. And the foreword is from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And he looked at it from what was happening in the financial markets. We live in a fiat system where they just create money, and it's, there's no value to it right now. They printed money, and it's like we're not producing things. So, of course, there's going to be inflation. There's less things to buy and just more credit and in 2019 something happened which the fed in the u.s was hiding at night and the media wasn't covered and those were the repo markets and the repo markets for those of you who don't understand what they are is banks at the end of the day they lend money to each other to actually cover off the loans and the money they spent during the day and it's an overnight market, it froze. No bank wanted to lend to another bank. So the feds had to come in and they had to, you know, they had to, they had to pr produce about 600 to a trillion dollars every night. They were printing that every night just to cover. And Edward Dow said, well, something's gonna happen because eventually it's all going to break down. And then COVID conveniently, happened where they actually shut us down now one of the things that he said was his wake-up moment he saw the head of the fed of kansas city get on national television and they were saying how are we going to get out of this and he said well we'll come up with some pass that will say whether someone is clean and whether someone's dirty and it was at that point he started doing his investigation so i believe that this is all tied together because at the top patrick it's always the same people you run against right it doesn't matter if it's like printing the money to the environment it's a narrative and it's a control narrative and it's also a scare narrative and that's just my thought and i want to ask you a question because it goes back to the root of why i really wanted to talk to you and the audience get to participate you survived 37 years of people who were your best friends, your greatest supporters turn on you because you were willing to speak your truth. And for those people willing to speak their truth right now, they say, you know, this just doesn't make sense. It's anti-human, it's wrong. From wrong to like having critical uh, race theory, telling little kids that, they're guilty for something that happened several hundred years ago and they weren't even part of the culture. Worse, 
in Canada, we never had that history, but we're told that we're bad for history that happened somewhere else to the point where just breathing is wrong. Just wanting to have your kids have a better life is wrong. And dealing with the fact that people closest to you, people who you felt should have said, I know Patrick, but they turned on you. How did you deal with this? Because millions and millions of people are now facing what you faced when you started saying, this is somewhat of a scam. Yeah, well, you the truth, your truth. Three is, is, is the only answer to that. Um, I, I what would... advice to a guy like me who's like, I was in the finance industry. I got people who defriended me, who are not talking to me, who think I flipped because I sort of have a memory of the way the world was. And I don't care what CBC says it is. I know what I, what like from my own experiences. Yes, well, just because everybody else goes crazy doesn't mean you have to. Um, and I, I, if there's one thing that I feel bad about, it is lost friendships. Uh, I like Bob Hunter, for example. basically smeared Can me. I, one of the reasons I reached out to you, Patrick, is because at the end of Bob Hunter, a, a friend of yours and someone who you created Greenpeace with, I used to be in his last years, I was a regular on the, the, doing the financial section on Hunter's Gathering. And I benefited from your friendship with him because he, he was very practical towards the end of his life towards so many things that for me i was you know i had these preconceived notions of an environmentalist and he was very practical at the end and i believe it had to do with your influence because we all have an impact and i just want to point this it doesn't matter if somebody doesn't agree with you in network theory, if one node changes, everything has to change. So, Patrick, if you could share that story about, about uh, Bob Hunter and yourself. Well, it was uh, a friendship from the start. Uh, he was a journalist, had the second front top editorial in the Vancouver Sun, which was the main Vancouver newspaper which is where Greenpeace started. And I was doing my PhD in ecology and I was reading him and he knew about me because I had got in the papers for, uh, during my PhD, beca it became controversial because I was countering uh, this huge mine proposals, uh, waste disposal program. And uh, to leave it at that, it was complicated, but I, I, I got in the public eye as a result. And so Bob and I knew each other vicariously. And when we met, it was at the first meeting of the Don't Make a Wave Committee where a number of new people came into what was, had been up till then a very small clique of people with this idea to sail a boat to the Aleutians to protest US hydrogen bomb testing. And Bob and I both, uh, both came in to say, we're in with this program and uh and that's how we met each other personally was at that first meeting we attended and we became fast friends immediately uh and and were for many many years uh long so we were together in greenpeace for a long time bob eventually burned out uh in the mid 70s and I took over as the president of the Greenpeace Foundation, which the original group was called, until 1979, when we decided to create Greenpeace International. And this was through a legal dispute among our various different cities, 
with Greenpeace groups. It was complicated, but we succeeded in negotiating myself and David McTaggart, who came to represent the other side of this dispute, uh, negotiated the charter for Greenpeace International in 1979. Bob was still active, even though he was outside the, he wasn't in any formal position, but he was still influential. And he influenced a structure of Greenpeace International that was, in, in my estimate, not as good as it could have been uh, from our point of view. But never mind that. We still were friends. Eventually, way later, when I had left Greenpeace, I was working in, the, in a forest industry forum. I'd also been a member of the BC Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy by this time. So I was, it, it, I was a public figure working with a big committee of citizens to try to balance environment and economy and social issues. So it was interdisciplinary ecology, um, but I was recruited onto a forestry program called the Forest Alliance of British Columbia. My family had been in forestry at that time by 80 years, now almost 100, although we're not logging any longer due to political and financial reasons. Uh, but I, I still, of course, I'm a strong supporter of, of uh, sustainable forestry. And, but I joined this group and ended up back in Toronto where Bob had gone by this time and was a public figure on TV and had a meeting with Monty Hummel of the World Wildlife Fund, who is part of the Betts group and all of that. Uh, Cause Gerald Betts, I mean, was, was, uh, yeah. part of the World Wildlife Fund at one point. Yeah. And Monty Hummel, anyways, was the head of it. And the World Wildlife Fund had just published a big, thick paper about how Canada was destroying all its forests and there wouldn't be any old growth left in so many years. And it was all a bunch of BS. And because uh, Canada has had a sustainable forest industry from the start. It, the, the, more trees now in the world than there were 200 years ago. Is that correct? Yes. And well, there's a whole story about that too. There's more, there is actually more forest area in the United States and Canada combined than there was in 1900. Most of the forest loss was for agricultural land and it occurred before 1900. So there, there has not been a significant loss of forest land in Canada or the United States in the last 120 years. Uh, but they still they hate it because you're cutting trees. It, they, they have an affinity for trees, which I do too. But I joined this group, the Forest Alliance of BC, to deal with the fact that the public, and most of the forestry in BC is on public land, to deal with the fact that the public had become turned against the forest industry by the environmental movement. And it was actually a really big threat to the industry. And I joined a group of former mayors and, and citizens of BC that were prominent. I had been a leader of Greenpeace. I was at that point the head of the BC Salmon Farmers Association because I started a salmon farm, which apparently is also evil. And so I joined this group and meeting with Monty Hummel said, Monty, this document that you have produced is completely false in its major conclusions about Canada losing all its forests, et cetera, right? So, and, and I, I, after that, I had a meeting with Bob Hunter and I think uh, the, head of the, uh, the head of the Forest Union of Canada was there at that meeting, Jack Monroe and Bob and some other people. And when Bob found out basically that I was part of the evil forest industry, uh, at a political level and a public level, he disowned me and wrote four columns in a, in, in a North Shore Vancouver newspaper, which ended up dubbing me the Eco Judas and basically just slimed me from okay. one end to the other. And uh, that caused about six of my best friends to decide that I was evil. And uh, that's what 
that's where it's sort of started. And since then, I have had uh, a number of friends basically disown me because of my opinions on ecology, forestry, uh, for example, the polar bears, their population has increased from between eight and 10,000 to 30 and 50,000 today since 1973, when an international treaty was signed among all polar nations to end the unrestricted hunting of polar bears. That's why they were declining, was overhunting. Uh, big game hunters would go up there to get some rugs for their fire, in front of their fireplace, and uh, the, the population was going down. Since then, because of the enforcement of the rules on, in some countries, outlawing taking polar bears altogether, the population has grown rapidly to be four and five times what it was then. But that's not what Coca-Cola and the others are insinuating in their ads and, and not what the environmental movement is insinuating in its propaganda about polar bears. Well, you shared, you shared a story about like when they show the starving polar bears, they're old bears, and that's what happens. They get yes, old. almost all they polar bears die of starvation they're... because they are the top predator. And there's no other animal, even when they're dragging their hind legs behind them and have no teeth left, they can take your face off with their front paw. So nobody's going to interfere with a dying polar bear. Right. Then they just die. And that there's no nursing homes. But it's for great for optics, right? It's great to yes. show it to raise money. Yes, it, it, it's, they say this is the face so, of climate change. My theory is universal theory of scare stories. Yes. Uh, is, is that they are all based on things that are either invisible or very remote. Yes. And CO2 and radiation are the classic invisible things that you can make scare stories about. And that gets back to nature. Nature, God, it's it's incredible. And I always think about the story of Job. And the part I find about the story of Job in the Bible, which is interesting to me, is Job is, you know, upset at God. So God takes Job to see how the universe works. And Job can't get it because it's just too complicated for you or I. However, there is an intelligence and there's individuals who believe in that intelligence not into man because what's become very clear is thinking man knows best and we just shown up and so many things have changed last yeah, question very good. so so you so many of your friends after you were labeled a heretic in the environmental movement. Tell me about the people who showed up afterwards. The one, the real people, the people who would be there with, you know when they say that you're a wealthy person, you've had like five real friends in your life. Like the real people. Yeah, I have, I have lots people. of, I have lots of real friends. I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about that. And my family is very close to me. Uh, they understand what I'm doing because I, I, I'm with them enough to explain it clearly. Uh, my, both my sons understand exactly what I'm doing. Uh, and they are both very productive boys. Uh, well, they're in their 30s and 40s. Uh, but, uh, and, and my wife thankfully puts up with me uh, but, and understands what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Uh, I am 75. Uh, I don't see any reason to stop, uh, but, uh, and I will keep on. Uh, I, I'm really happy with my book, the fact that it has been received very well, especially by my peers. Uh, I'm a director of the CO2 Coalition, which has over 100 top scientists, economists, engineers, etc., and uh, they like it. It explains things, I think, very well. Uh, I, I, I put a lot of effort into that book. It took a year to write it. And that's fake, invisible catastrophes and threats. And threats of doom, doom on Amazon.com or CA. Uh, it's uh, available anywhere in the world on Amazon. And it's available in an ebook, like a Kindle, or an audio book, yes. or a paperback, or a hardcover. So it's in and all. And I would recommend my recommendation is to understand how we can get fooled into a narrative 
to read Patrick's book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes in the Threat of Doom. It is an excellent book and don't take my word for it. There is close to 3000 positive reviews on Amazon, which is incredible. Patrick, thank you so much. Thank you for spending you, Peter. this time with me and have a wonderful day. And it's always a pleasure. And the greatest healer for anybody later on in life is to mentor younger people. I, and I find this all the time. I sit down with uh, business owners all the time and they always give me unsolicited advice because they want to share their knowledge. And it's really important. Here with me is Peter Merrick. President of MerrickWealth.com. Peter is an income and capital enhancement consultant. Speaker and author. He is also a recognized expert in succession planning. There's over 800 published articles and three industry textbooks. He's a Canadian. We joined us today from San Diego, California. Thanks for joining us. So Peter Merrick, tell us about you. Well, I've been in the financial service industry since the end of 1991. I graduated during the recession. The baby boomers were in their positions, so there was no jobs. So the two businesses that opened up were the technology field and the financial field. It was the Wild West in both of them. So I had this brilliant idea, and I had a friend of mine, and we started talking, and I said, hey, how difficult would it be for us to get a mutual fund dealer license? Not difficult enough. <laughs> Thank God for those 10 years, the market just went up. I would sit down and I would take somebody's entire life savings that they spent 15, 20 years accumulating it, this young kid who knew nothing about nothing, and I would go and just invest it. And luckily it went up because the markets were crazy in the 90s. A boom time. But in 2004, my life blew up. I almost went bankrupt, but I was very fortunate because there were very few CFPs at the time, but every university in Canada wanted to offer the CFP program. So I got recruited as a prof. And it was great. I was reading all the textbooks. I would call all the big publishers. And what I came to the conclusion was the succession planning was missing. One of the issues was is there was very little talking beyond the accumulation stage. Like how do you have a healthy life after you've done that? I also looked at demographics. At the turn of the 20th century, the average life expectancy in the West and North America was 43 years old. And people are dying at 83. No one ever lived 83. Well, you know, so I always say that there's two financial plans. There's a financial one that we work on, and there's a what you get to do with all your time and that energy once you're done. And with this thing that they've been racing towards, they've hit it. But if they haven't thought about what they're gonna do after or how they're gonna feel validation for their existence, they just never stop. They just keep going. Well, it's not anybody's fault because when people are young, they focus too much on doing. And later on in life, they have to focus on being. So I wrote my own textbooks because I thought it was very important to talk about how do you transition from the first half of life, which Carl Jung called it the morning, mm -hmm. where you're accumulating, whether it's your ego, yep. designations, education, houses. The second half is deconstruction, giving wisdom away, giving away my money, giving away my time, leaving a legacy. So talk to me about that stage. What's the purposeful way or kind of the best practices, ways, or considerations for people to take when transitioning into that stage of life? Well, one, decide whether or not you want an exit. I find between the ages of 55 and 70, a lot of people feel that I'm just tired doing the same thing that I've always done and I have the money now. So maybe I should get out when the going is good and pass on my business to someone who's got the energy to navigate it. Number two, who are you going to sell your business to? There's one issue about selling it to a family member or an employee. What happens after you sell it? Things don't go right. A lot of business owners want to sell their business because they just want to wash their hands. But by selling it to someone you know, you're not getting out of your business. The best is to sell to a third-party purchaser. 
the last one is after they make that transition from being a business owner, building a nest egg for themselves to have choice, they don't know what they're going to do. I've spoken to people who say, you know, I'm going to take up golf. So my question is, do you golf now? I don't golf now. So what makes you think you're going to golf later? I just want to share with you guys a story. There was a gentleman whose name was Bob Hunter. He was quite a celebrity. He started Greenpeace during the height of my blow up. When I was going through business loss, he was bringing me on national television. And you know what he was doing? He was saying, so Peter, don't you do that? And then he would give my phone number and he would give my uh, web address. The reason why I went by MerrickWealth.com because it was almost like a phone number that would run across the television and I could actually see myself making money off of it. And he was dying. He had prostate cancer. And he turned to me and said, Peter, one day you will be in a position that you'll help someone else. And let me share with you about the legacy. Bob's been dead for 16 years. And I'm sharing you the legacy of Bob Hunter because he made a difference for me. And if I make a difference in anyone else's life, I'm a product of those people who are willing to do things and they had no expectations. And the true mentor is someone who has no expectations that they're going to see the tree blossom. The reason I wrote The King of Main Street is younger people don't know how to find the right mentors and older That's people nice. have this need to mentor. It's almost like a biological need because they can see beyond their physical existence. They know that the sun was here before them and it will be after them yeah. and what's going to be left behind that they leave. I would joke, I can't make you money, but I can definitely save you money. What I mean by that is I am a Sherpa. That's someone who would guide someone to help them come down. But I realize the most precious asset they have is not their money. It's their time. What last piece of advice would you like to give our listeners? If you have a business, the most important thing to ask yourself is why did you get into the business? And it's usually not to create a legacy, it's to create the lifestyle that you want. And at that point, ask yourself, what do you want to do during your last days? The last human freedom is to choose one's own beliefs, one's own way. Everything else you can have taken away from you what you believe and how you choose to act in the world that is yours and the greatest healer for anybody later on in life is to mentor younger people and that is going to give you fulfillment emotionally spiritually and mentally you guys have been wonderful and i want to thank you and i hope you guys have a great day thank you